right club. Be the right club today. Yes! Again, have to be careful of the speed. What a comeback season for Hal Sutton. Come right back toward the hole. Seventeen years later, Hal Sutton is the Players' Champion. Well, he's got it going right at the black stick. It'll be up. Yeah. It is. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Be the Right Club Today podcast. Hal, it was a little bit of karma at the U.S. Open. It was. I was uh, happy to see John Rahm end up winning, and boy, did he play strong coming down the stretch. Yeah, I hate to admit this publicly, but I was. Uh, we were at some friend's house, and we had to run and go get food, and I actually didn't see his putt on 17 or 18. I came back home. I came back to the house, and I saw Louie was on 17, and I saw him hook, tug it left on 17, and it kind of ended it right there. Yeah. You know, uh, it's kind of an age-old problem with what I've been talking about. I couldn't believe Louie laid up on 18. He got. He makes six. He's still tied for second. He's finished second in however many majors. Yeah. And uh, he hit it in the left rough, right? Yeah, he hit yeah. it in the left rough off the tee. And you know, you know, if he could have squeezed squeezed it up there on the right hand side into the bunker, or just short of the green on the right side, chipping it in or holding it out of bunker yeah. is a lot easier than making a eighty sure. yard shot. Sure. And you know, uh, m- money. Money is dictating some of these things, you know. Um, how about the how about the moxie of of John Rom? I mean, heck, through through nine holes, really. I mean, that that leaderboard there, everybody had a everybody, chance. Everybody could have won. It was exciting to watch from yeah. that standpoint. But you know, John, he just he's got what it takes inside. I mean, he's tough. And, you know, I played against a lot of Spaniards in my life. They're all tough. They go down with a ship. Yep. And, uh, you know, he stayed in there and fought hard. He's a great putter under pressure. I mean, he's made a lot of putts under pressure. And How do you think Tory fared? I think Tory fared fine. Yeah. yeah, I think it played – it was a good test. I mean, those guys, the last nine holes, uh, you know, Bryson being at the top of the list it had – struggled yeah it got it got tricky you know brooks bogeyed 16 and 17 i believe 15 and 16 17 18 something he bogeyed two coming down the stretch he was four under for a long time i remember watching it was interesting i you know i talking to some people it didn't it didn't look like the rough didn't look like a typical u.s open but it was man it played like one well there were a lot of really thick places and a lot of really thin places. Yeah. It just kind of depended on where you got the ball. Golf course was playing long, uh, usual Southern California weather. Um, not a lot of wind, but what was there, it was probably, you know, they had sweaters on early mm-hmm. on Sunday. So, yeah. you know, making those putts at the end of the day are tough. Sure. I mean, I remember in 08 with Tiger making that putt on 18. I mean, that ball bounced. 15 times you yeah. know, bouncing around all over the place yeah. and i think it was brandle or somebody tweeted about how the last two u.s opens at tory have produced the best player in the world at that particular time tiger obviously and, and john's rom's obviously playing some great great golf well you know i was uh, i couldn't believe what happened to john rom at the memorial and boy that you know that was a expensive thing that happened i mean that cost him several million dollars to be honest with you and i tell you what i really think we need to emphasize here is how classy john rom handled the closing ceremony and how he talked about how devastating COVID had been and he understood um and you know he believes in karma he thinks you know it came back around for him and and uh you know i just 
you know, I was I've always appreciated John Rahm's game. Right. I'm a John Rahm fan, now, sure, and sure. it'd be hard not to like John Rahm. That's right. That was pretty special. I mean, just to you know to make the putts he made, but then also, like you said, the from the memorial issue, like I mean that that cost him eight to fifteen million dollars in in the grand scheme of things, and. For him to handle it, I mean, he just had to go out on Sunday and play with a pulse, and he was going to win by three or four, right. you know. And for him to handle it the way he did, you you mentioned he might have been uh, might have been schooled on how to handle that a little bit. Well, I mean, I don't know that. It's just it was a thought to me because I feel like the the, the tour, tour the out. tour probably took a lot of heat for what happened. Yeah, and I think John Rom, the way he handled that, took all the heat off he of sure the tour. Did. He kind of saved him a little bit. They, yeah, yeah. So I don't know. You know, who knows? It was a great, either way, it was a great open, um, great U.S. Open, great, great tournament, lots of, you know, lots of great storylines, and, and obviously one of the best players in the in the world came out, came out on top, and it's definitely, definitely entertaining. So, part two, Rob Holding this week, uh, part one was very well received, um, talked a, a little bit more about, you know, what he looked for in his, in his, with, you know, players coming to his academy and and one of the one of my big takeaways from last week was you know again there's just we've talked about all the time and there's just no magic pixie dust in this game there's just no we, we we wish we had a bunch of magic pixie dust bottled up that we could sprinkle over all of our students but it takes discipline it takes hard work it takes determination it takes perseverance it takes sacrifice it just takes so many things commitment to be great at this game and he he echoed that completely well, you know, he's been a really good player himself, and then, you know, he's watching great players. There's no shortcut to success in this yeah. game. I tell you, you know, obviously track man and, and all the many things that we have, video cameras, and and um, they help. Yeah. And But they don't cut the time and no. – you know, a third or a quarter or anything else. I mean, it takes work after work yeah. after work. And in the end, I think they make our job as instructors easier, more knowledgeable, more. We're, we're again, we're guessing less, but it still doesn't take away the hard work that it takes to be great and win at a high level. That the that you you know you guys as PJ Tour players had to do to get there. And to, can, you know, again, can we find your the best version of Hal Sutton a little quicker with this technology? Probably. Can we keep you from going off the, the, the deep end for and searching for things for as long as you might have searched for them back in the day? Sure. But you still have to put in the time. So at the end of the day, there is no medicine, no shot, no pill, no nothing yeah. that will give you the desire to be the best. We can give you a lot of the other information that yeah. will help you be the best. But in the end, and Rod – explains that pretty yes. extensively yeah, yes he does yeah rob did a, did a great job and explain that one thing too that just kind of popped in my head that you've talked about a lot is that you know one small feel one small swing thought one small movement one small anything in this game isn't going to change your life mm -hmm. i always thought it was oh i i got it i got it i got it <laughs> well I, I got a little bit amazed when they were talking about you know, Bryson with what he found had came to him in the night. I don't know if you heard anything about that, you know, and he, and, you know, he, he found a field that felt yep. good to him and he was playing good with it. Well, that field went away on was, that back nine. It was a, it was a nine hole field. <laughs> it was a, right? yeah. But it's amazing how many times we as golfers think we got it, we got it, we got it. And we, we borrow it for a little bit and then, and then it, it, it wow. leaves us. Well, Chase, I'm 63 years old. I quit wondering a long time ago whether that exists or not. I know it doesn't exist. I've never seen anybody with it or anything right. else. So, right. uh, you know, if y'all ever find it out there, y'all let Chase and I know. Let us know because we're we, yeah we we wish we could we could find the one thing that's going to work forever. Yeah. Part two, Rob Holding again for those listening in the car or uh, or you know on on all the all the podcast platforms. Um, Rob talks a little bit more about the golf swing in this episode, and um, he demonstrates a little bit. Um, and so if there's some stuff you missed, check us out on YouTube. We've got all these recorded on YouTube. You can see them. You can see everything that he talks about, all the stuff he demonstrates, and, and get a, a much better visual there. So you guys enjoy part two, Rob Holding. Golf swing. Look, if you ever hit balls with your feet together? Yeah, I'm sure at some point Hal's done I that. have a lot. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's like a homepage. It's like, okay, uh, my swing was feeling a little weird today. Let's go back to basics. Let's put the hands in the club. Let's relax. 
put the feet together, let's swing waist high to waist high. You know, let's sync it up. Let's get the ball going straight. Let's hit a seven iron 120 yards over that little sign over there. And then let's hit it 140 and then 160 with your feet together. And then start putting your feet apart. And then before you know it, you're trying too hard. You're putting too much effort into a game. Your dispersion goes down and you realize, okay, I just have to reset here and I have to get stay on my lane on the road here and I have to stay in this box. I have to stay in this channel today. And, and it comes down to balance, comes down to sequencing, comes down to letting, you know, the energy pass into the car, let it do the work, uh, not steering it around the golf course. So oh. just my 10 cents. So Rob, real quick, a quick, a quick, very loaded follow-up question on, on your feet together statement. Would you rather see if, if you could only teach arms and hands or say pivot and body, which one would you rather, which one would arms you rather? And hands. Arms and I, hands. I, I figured that was what you would say, but expand just a little bit on that. Okay. Um, the body is capable of putting adverse forces and effects on the hand path. Okay. It's also plays an important role in shaping the hand path. And the only thing that events that is moving that golf club are the hands. The hands are the only thing attached to the golf club. The lead hand has a role. The trail hand has a role. They both have different roles, even though they're coupled together. They're both applying different forces in different directions at the same time on the golf club. So if the body is moving too laterally or linearly, it has an effect on the shape of that hand path. It's going to delay the release, in some cases, of the club. It's really relative to where the position of the club is in your transition. Uh, I, you know, there's a, most, most people even, most people would be afraid of the word of casting the club. Here's an interesting thing. I'll show you. I'll try and demonstrate it really quickly. Uh, if you can see this, I'll just back up here a bit. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll move my camera over here. <clears throat> Okay, so we can see. All right, if I do a backswing like this and I pull my hand down toward the ball, the hand is pulling in this direction. It's pulling the handle that way. What's the club? The club is dumping early. If I hold the angle and I pull it here, like that feels like I'm holding the angle, but this club has already started to go that way. Now, here's another interesting thing. If I have the club in this position, the top of that one, and I move the hands that way towards the track man, or away from my shoulder with the club in this position, watch what the club does. So when you're widening your arc, you're also shallowing your arc. You're also increasing the lag. When you're delaying the release, you're getting the club into a lower, shallower position here. And then the angular forces from the body can really kick in and do its magic. So starting with a downswing is not down and it's not forward. It's away from you. This arm hinges this way, the hand is moving closer. The, that club is moving closer to the center of your body, the pivoting point. It has to be moved back away in transition. It happens so quickly, it doesn't look like the player's going that way. The good players are, in fact, Delaying the body turn here. We're not in a hurry to fire the body and turn the shoulders. Because if I do that, watch. If I turn my shoulders really faster than the club in a decent position, the club reacts and goes that way. Well, we don't win. So that's what I'm trying to say is an overly aggressive body movement, either from the legs or the torso, is not helping the hand path do what it needs to do. Hand path simply needs to go around like this, it goes away. Go over here again, you have a nice wide arc. It's more efficient. You don't have to swing like a maniac at it. Um, go ahead. You want a question? Yeah, so real quick. So for those listening on, on Apple or on Spotify, check us out on YouTube. There's Rob's demonstrating some really cool stuff. So so check us out on YouTube. You can see the video. All right, Rob, yeah. follow, follow up to that. What about the guys that, we get so many that have low point control issues, low points too far back and, and arms are way back at six. So they're like, they're like back here too much. Okay. So 
watching watching this player on video can send even to a really experienced instructor a lot of mixed signals and it can it can get you can go down a rabbit hole. But the basic thing is if you see a player that's doing that, that problem is likely occurring in the backswing, not the downswing. Earlier, yeah. Right? So if I get open and I'm stuck behind, I probably overswung, overturned, and put the club there in the first place. Yeah. Now my hips are doing what they want to do, and my legs are trying to help change direction, my torso, but I'm I'm coming in stuck, right? And and so what how do you fix that? Well, you have to like, okay, tell you what, take that player, put your feet together and see if you can hit the golf ball. They can't. They'll shank it, they'll pull it, they'll do it, it'll go all over the place. They're out of perspective. Golf swing, when you're moving efficiently, uh, your there's a relationship between everything, right? The, the, the what I find is that uh, a lot of people think that turning the body really hard creates a lot of power. It contributes probably 15 or 20 percent to the actual speed. 70, 75 percent of the actual speed in the golf span. So let's turn my phone off here. <laughs> yeah. it happens from about here. It happens from about here to here. So this is where the actual speed width starts to come in from the, from the hands and body. Now, if I'm here and I rotate, that isn't going in the right direction to create the speed to, to, to get the low point where, where it should be. Um, we get a kick out of this, but we do this with, with adults and kids. If this was a piece of wood, and this was an axe, and you wanted to split the log, would you hold the angles? No. You would go. All right, there's a true. Now, if you look at that from the side, what just happened? My hands started going away from my body, that way. My hips went this way, which changes the curvature of the handle. And that's what's accelerating and creating that angular force and angular momentum. So I take them and I put the bag over here. And go like this. Now, hit the bag. Did I turn my body in fire? No. If I move the bag out of the way and I do the same thing. Now, it's, it happens, right? And, and the harder I swing in the right direction, guess what else happens? When I go like this and I create a force going in the opposite direction, what are my legs doing here? Stabilizing. Now, they're going that way, right? They're pushing, they're counterbalancing. So weight shift is happening. I don't have to try and push off. I don't have to try and push up. All I'm trying to do is hit this golf ball the right place, <laughs> the right spot on the ball. I don't need all this extraneous movement going on to do that efficiently. The difference, let us put it this way. I could probably crank up my club speed with an iron four to six miles an hour with a lot of excessive movement. But if you look at how my numbers change, my dispersion's all over the place. That doesn't make any sense to me. So, anyway. Al, follow up. <laughs> I'm overwhelmed. Well, uh, some of that's similar to what um, to what you you know spring in the shaft, and there, there's some similar concept that, concepts that you did for a little while. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was taught to spring the shaft, and as you spring the shaft. You go away from the body and spring it that way, which is kind of what you just described. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the same. This is what I'm, I'm laughing about. Like the con Those concepts, are they work. They obviously work for you. They obviously work for, for you know, whoever that great teacher was that, that you know, knew that. Uh, they would be laughing. They'd be maybe rolling in their grave right now. They'd be going, you know, what are you guys thinking about? Uh, I'm, I'm not a. I think some of the other people, like Quan and Duffy and, and Sasho, uh, uh, they've had a, an influence on the teaching as well. Um, uh, some of the stuff when I first met Sasho that he demonstrated with Chris Como, I, I looked at it and I thought that's BS. That can't be right. 
So I go to work the next day and I experiment with what they were doing in it Israel. Right. It's amazing, but we never thought of it. You know, there were plane boards. Yeah. Yeah. Well, funny thing about those plane boards, I had a really good plane board. And the two best players I ever had, I had to get them to stop using it because they were going to break their wrist. They would swing the thing back on the plane and they'd shallow it and it would come in underneath the board and they'd get jammed up and hurt, hurt themselves. And he, well, geez, that swing should work on that arc. You know, you think, no, it doesn't work on that arc. No, it shouldn't be. No, it, what, it, what, why? Well, this is, if, I, if you have time, I'll show you. Like if you, if you have a club here, in the line with your hands, your hands are going up and down this way. The center mass of the club is going to follow the direction of your hand. If you have the club on this angle and I move the hand straight down, the club's going to pitch over this way. That's what you want in a golf swing. So you don't want this thing perfectly on plane. You want the club head moving in your back swing. The club head is moving this way. You just look at the club head, it's moving that way. And this momentum is going to want to help pitch it over a bit. And you want that to happen because you're changing direction dynamically. Now the club will kick back over down here. If it's perfectly in line with the direction your hand is moving, center of mass of the club is going to follow that direction. It's not going to create a rotational effect on the club face. Very good. Like, very good thing to understand. So that was, that was that's, that's the difference between, you know, still, and the, and the, if those guys had the eye and they had that look and the top by looking by feel. And that's a lot easier to understand for people, but the actual science is verifying that this is why it works. This is what actually is going on here. As far as the golf club is concerned, your hand path in relation to the center mass of the club head, this is what's really happening. And well, people will figure out all kinds of crazy ways to manipulate that. Well, they I, don't think, really I think too, like, you know, talking about how, you know, how being one of the ball strikers, I mean, his, that motion you just did was exactly how he swung it. It was a bit more vertical coming back and then he laid it down slightly and got the, got the, the center mass behind the hand path coming down first move. And then it, it made it easier right. to swear. I mean, he was, he was beautiful. And, and not only easier, but more consistent. Yeah. Right. Because the club, the club had, you want, it's, it's a fine line, isn't it? You want leg. You don't want, you want some forward shaft lean, certainly with your irons, but you don't want to lose all of it, but it's in the process of releasing. And, and, and you ever watch, I have this video that I show all my girls. It's, uh, it's some guys in Vietnam are teaching. There's I don't know, seven or eight girls in a row swinging one armed, full swing, full speed, seven irons and drivers. And the ball is just striped every time. It's very interesting. Uh, 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 but it's called uh, Vietnam, uh, Swing Vietnam or something like that on YouTube. You can look it up. Uh, it's, uh, let's see, I have a link here. Anyway, uh, when you do this, oh, what you're doing uh, is this. They go, you set up with the ball, put the arm there, this is pulling back, back, pulls back, goes through. And they just, now most people, when they try to do that, they'll pull with the arm, and the face stays wide open and they'll shank it. I self included the first time I tried it. What is making this work is exactly what we're talking about this transition. Now the hand pass can start to curve. This is going to pitch out and go over. So that's, that's the role the body plays in it. If you watch these beautiful swings, you don't see the feet are quiet. The legs look quiet. The body looks stable. It doesn't look like they're dancing around and jumping off the ground. You know, it, it's, and they're making solid contact. And uh, uh, when you have that sense of timing, you can, you can do a lot of different, you have a lot of options how you hit that golf shot. Right? You can create a little more lag or a little less lag, hit under the tree, hit under the tree. But you're going to hit the ball first, not the world first. So, so Rob, you you obviously teach mainly indoors. You've got a lot of technology like we do here. One one of the topics that Han and I talk about a lot is art versus science. How do you obviously the 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 game the the players playing at the the highest levels need both. They're going to need to understand some of some of this stuff, but then they're also going to have to keep their artists artistry intact as far as hitting different shots at different times. How do you teach that to your players? 
I, I apologize. I, I, I didn't quite get the drift of the question. Technology, better players. Yeah, so how do you keep your players from being too one-dimensional indoors, hitting the same shot over and over and over and over and over again and trying to perfect numbers versus – hitting different windows like Tiger talked about, working the golf ball and, and being more of an artist and trying to hit soft little seven irons to back right pins instead of ripping nine irons. Right. Uh, well, first thing, the way my brain works is that uh, if I have a student that's achieved a level where they come in week to week or twice a week and you're hitting the seven iron and the numbers look the same and they're, they have a pretty consistent, predictable path attack angle, then I'm going to ask them, okay, do you like hitting draws? Yeah. Can you hit a fade? Yeah, sort of. I said, well, let's work back and forth here without changing your swing. Let's change your alignment, change your ball position, and see if you can move the ball left to right and right to left and switch it up a little bit. So they're not one-dimensional players. I don't really know if, if until you get to that point where they have some basic consistency that you can – you can get into being too creative. I think Hal would agree with me. Uh, there's a lot of very good, talented people out there that are a little too creative for their own good. Like they, all they see is big draws and big fades, and they're trying to attack every pin. And they might be successful often, but they're also going to shoot themselves in the foot often. And net net, they're not coming out ahead. Like it's it's uh, uh, Hogan. I love Hogan's idea. Uh, on course management. I like Annika Sorensen's idea on how she managed course. And it's very simple. The flag is on the right side of the green. The ball starts at the middle and moves toward the flag. If it's on the left, it starts at the middle and moves toward the flag. Hogan said, if I'm playing with a player and there's a front right bunker and the pin's cut behind it and that guy's hitting a draw into that pin, I know I'm going to beat him. Now, mark, now, back pin, lower shot, trajectory, land in the middle of the green, work toward the hole. Front pin, high shot trajectory, maybe carry it past the flank. Don't leave it short. Monica Sorenstam said to me that, that uh, said not to me, but in, in a book, her caddy would say, she would she would say, what's the distance to the front edge of the green? 135. What's the distance to the pin? 150. She'd hit a shot that would land between the front of the green and the pin. Pretty simple, right? Now, I'm sure that she didn't do that 100% of the time, but basically 100% of the time, that's her first thought process. And then if she needed to modify it or she was particularly feeling really good today, maybe she got a little more aggressive than that or the conditions of the course change. But they have a certain way of looking at a hole that's consistent. Uh, the basic thing. Uh, uh, so, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so, so, so I will – okay, so technology – uh, you know, I honestly, I honestly uh, uh, don't see too many of my players that are capable of consistently working the ball without practicing it a lot. And and uh, uh, if your job is a is a turn is a professional golfer, your job is to be able to go to work every day and work on hitting shots and being confident that you can execute the shot when you want to on command. For amateur golfers, it's not usually quite the case. They don't really have the time to, to, to practice them. So basic rule of thumb, don't do shots in a tournament that you haven't practiced. <laughs> right? It, it's risky. <laughs> Unless you absolutely have to and you have no choice, but you usually have a choice. Yeah. Um, kids, like little kids, uh, I don't I don't like little kids, meaning, oh, like your typical 12-year-old kid who's doing really well. Uh, I, I'm not working, moving, working on moving the ball with them. I'll work on trouble shots. I'll work on punch shots from under the tree, hitting a low fade or maybe a low hook. But I don't, I don't, I don't want them firing at every pin. <laughs> sure. Al, thoughts? Well. There was a lot to take in. Uh, so I have a question for you along the lines of the art and the science. Do you believe you start kids, you said at seven? Yeah. Uh, would you be opposed to having a kid from seven to ten years old that never saw a golf course? 
and you develop their arms and their hands and their body sequencing and all of that, and then get them to the golf course after they understood the golf swing a little bit. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm putting you on the spot, Rob. Uh, no, I wouldn't. Uh, in my world, uh, I've actually seen this happen. I've actually yeah. seen where we've given a kid a lesson. We've been, my academy has been giving a family golf lessons for almost a year, maybe twice a week. And the best, the closest they get to a golf course is a driving range. And then, well, <laughs> there's golf swings. There's mechanics and there's playing golf. And they're two sort of different things, aren't they? They, they grass can get wet, the grass can get long. The, <laughs> you have a factor of wind to deal with. You have all these different dimensions to the game that you have to experience. And and uh, so uh, my my answer to the question is if that if that's your idea, then um, you're not going to be in our high performance program. You need to be a. You need to learn the game in context, and I. It, it, I would rather see somebody going out on the golf course and struggling than not being on the golf course at all. And uh, uh, on the other hand, I don't want somebody going on the golf course that's totally unprepared. <laughs> to, well, the reason why I ask that question is is because that seven to ten year old can't put all <laughs> those pieces of the puzzle together to even understand them to be yeah. honest with you. And so you mentioned that you like, if you only could teach one thing is arms and hands basically, uh, and sequencing. So, you know, uh, it took so me, I, I, I was a big, I was a big Jimmy Ballard fan one time. Well, I took a lot of lessons from Jimmy Ballard. Okay. So, uh, I played pretty damn well following Jimmy's advice. I was very consistent. But guess what? I was about 30 yards shorter off the tee than I should have been for my size. All right. So because I believe that, you know, those arms and hands stay there and you're using your body all the time. Now, I never had a lesson from the man. And one of the things I've learned probably the hard way sometimes is don't criticize another teacher until you've had a lesson from them. Because what comes across in books and what comes across it isn't necessarily what they're going to give you if you're standing in front of them. So Anyway, that's like 10 cents on, on, well, on body and arms. I, I will tell you where I got this. Jim Flick wrote a book, as you know, and Jim Flick started in the book and said, and he taught, as you know, he taught with Toski and Golf Digest schools. The guy taught golf for 60 years, and he puts in his book that I start with the arms and hands. The arms and hands educate, you know, we have to educate the arms and hands. And at that point, I nearly put the book down and threw it away. Because I was coming out of that Ballard era and that body era. And, I, and, I, and this is too old school. This can't, can't be right. A few years later, I picked the book up again and go back and read right through it. And he says, now, once you've got this part working properly, then we're going to teach you how to fade the ball. Then we're going to teach you how to work the ball. Then we're going to teach you how the body kicks in. I go back to my own experiences. When I first started teaching, I had a bunch of, retirees of 55 to 65 year old guys that are living the dream. They bought the house at the golf course. They want to get better at golf. They're not in the best of shape. And they come to you for golf lessons and you try and teach them to use their legs and their body because they all want to use their hands. And after five weeks, the guy's not getting better. And you have that heart to heart talk like this isn't working. Is it? No, it's not working. It's not getting any better. And I said to this guy one time, uh, who's in pretty good shape, uh, I'm going to give you your next best option. If this is really difficult and you can't see the other, let's, I'll show you how to hit the ball from waist high to waist high with your arms, forearms, hands, and shoulders. And you'll strike it. Now, literally, the first swing that the guy made his body did exactly what I had wanted it to do, which was trying to get it to do for five weeks. He's focusing on his feet and his legs and trying to move while he's trying to hit a golf ball. My secret here, if, if you've listened to anything, if you've heard anything today that you think was interesting, this should resonate in, some, in a teacher's mind. If you can teach a person to stand fairly still and hit the ball hard with your forearms and hands and hit it well, 
you'll notice that for the brain to coordinate a nice turning motion in the arms and hands, and the shoulders working together with those arms and hands, and then doing your job, the brain is amazing. It will make the feet and the hips and the core support what the brain is trying to do. And it will happen. It's not something you have to think about. Uh, uh, the golf swing, as everybody knows it, seven tenths of a second is just too fast to be, to be thinking about a lot of stuff in your downswing. Uh, but if you've spent your lifetime like you hitting golf balls, you can do some pretty funky stuff midway down in your downswing because your perception is so good where that club edge is. You can sense it's two degrees more open than it should be, and you're going to have a chance to, you know, alter it a little bit. But most people can't do that. I, 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 uh, I do believe that weight transfer, side to side linear motion is very important in a golf swing. It, there's lots of ways of hitting a ball without doing that. But I believe that when you want to have a really consistent, simple motion, you're going to have pressure moving. Uh, the, the idea, uh, all of the good players that I've tested are running around 70, around 70 to 74%. Pressure on the trail foot, top of back swing, change of, changing of direction, especially part. They're not up around 80, 85. Um, I see the same thing. I, 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 don't, I don't see these linear traces where the trace is going way out over the foot or it's too straight for too long. It's, there's a period there where it's, it's changing direction. There's a, a, a curving window in there in between the feet someplace. Um, it's, it's, uh, uh, is it wrong to? I don't know. I've not had a lot of success telling people to dive down deep into their left leg and, and extend as hard as they can. Um, just, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I got a question here for you that's pretty interesting. What would Rob the coach tell Rob the player 30 years ago? Oh, okay. Um, I, I went to see 19 different golf teachers over a period of about through maybe 15 or 16 years. People, a lot of people don't know this. I got into the golf business fairly late and I became a player fairly late. But first from age 20 to about 35, I was in the restaurant business for a long time. And my heart was in golf. I went to golf, I went to the PGA and said, can I get a job? And I couldn't find a job where I could make a good enough living to justify it. But I had lots of job offers that didn't pay well enough compared to running a restaurant. So I ended up getting trapped in that world for a while. Eventually, I just decided I was going to change and I went to run a golf course. And then, uh, after about four or five years of running a golf course, I had a lot of opportunity to play more, get better. And then I really started seeking help and instruction. Um, so the first, first thing that came to my mind is first find a good coach. Find someone with a proven rate of success. Not a lot of talk, not a lot of BS, but they can actually show you these are the long-term players I've worked with. And if your goal is to be as good as you can be, find somebody that knows that journey and has demonstrated success on that path. I'll tell you why. Because it's different being a coach than a teacher. If I like I was the other part people don't know about Rob Holding is that when Rob was oh 12, 13 years old, he was the best it was in Ontario in track and field. And when I was 14, I was recruited to the Canadian Olympic track and field team. And it was there that I learned about work ethic. I imagine being a 14 year old kid and there's Olympic gold medalists on the floor doing stretching on each side of you. And they're working a hell of a lot harder than you could imagine. You didn't even know your body could do these things. I'd have to, I'd get home at 11 o'clock at night and I'd have to sit in a hot tub. Otherwise I'd be too stiff the next day to, to go to school. And I do this every day. And, and uh, uh, that's where you learn about what it takes to be world class at the top. So all those experiences, life experiences, and that in the restaurant business, and the people business, and the working in human resources and hiring people, creating training programs, communicating with people, understanding people's goals and their dreams, that all fit in nicely to the teaching career. All, it, it's just like a you know, brainer. So you've got this athletic background, You've got communication skills. That's a pretty good prerequisite. This is the type of person, if you have high, high goals as a player, that you want to associate with. If you want to be a recreational golfer, 
there's a lot of people out there that can get you from shooting 95 to 85 to 82 or whatever your goal is. And you want to shoot subpar golf and you want to not even necessarily be a tournament golfer. You just want to, you just want to experience going low. Then you need to get really good coaching. And, and uh, so you're not wasting a lot of time. I figured that my own, in my own trial and error, I probably wasted 70% of all of my practice time doing the wrong things, trying to figure it out either by myself or following the wrong advice. I'd had somebody that could teach like I can teach it for two years. I could go from shooting 78 to 68 because I'm willing to work. I'm willing to put the work in. Just tell me what to do. Right. Well, well, Rob, one of the things I've written down in my notes to just kind of recap some of this is, you know, there's no pixie dust to get great at this game. You know, it's the same thing that Hal and I preached all of our players too. You need hard work, you need dedication, you need discipline, you need focus, you need all of that stuff, right? And then you need coaches that care about you that have some understanding and can help develop and answer the questions that you that you have. And I, it's awesome that you're literally repeating a lot of the same talking points that we tell a lot of our players. And that's, we're trying to, obviously you've built something special there and we're, we're building something special here. We're a couple, a few years behind you. We got started a little late on this thing, but, uh, but we're, we're, I mean, really when Hal and I got together a, a year ago talking about this, it was like your, your Academy was the, was the, the standard, like you, you've done everything that we're trying to get to and trying to, trying to build. Um, I've got, I got one more question that I want you to apply this to both juniors. And I want you to apply this to our so recreational golfers listening, listening at home. One of the things that you talked about earlier that we both, we both talk about a lot and how, how did, does a great job with this is, um, you know, not, you know, how says he was only forced to swing hard a few times around at the moment. He, he didn't swing hard all the time. He was forced to swing hard. So we talk about creating efficient speed and swinging within ourselves. How do we though, there's a the game's moving towards a bomb and gouge game where it's already there. How do we also create speed, right? So how do you take a player that swinging at it pretty efficiently and is still a little bit is too short to be as great as they need to be, or take an an, an older gentleman that's still wanting to create some speed and hit it a little bit farther? How does Rob holding what what would be your your little ten cent tip on speed creation? Uh, strength. Okay, okay, that would be the first simple answer. Um, how strong are they? And if they are strong, then the next step is how coordinated are they? Can they coordinate that strength? So sometimes you'll find people that uh, are fairly strong, but they're not really well coordinated. Uh, their sequence isn't very good. Uh, your concept mentally may be off. I find, like, I hate speed sticks. I'm sorry to throw that in there, but uh, uh, depends on the, uh, the application and the player, of course. But what I, my experience, uh, do people swing faster? No, they don't. They just swing, start to swing closer to their potential. Okay? So there's a very easy answer to this question. What happened with Bryson DeChambeau in the last 16 months? How come he was able to get his clubhead speed up almost, I think, 30 miles an hour, his driver? That was no pixie dust. He, doubled he got it. a lot stronger, right? <laughs> he had good coordination, but he didn't have the, he didn't have the, the strength to, to be able to move a golf club that fast. He didn't have the stability to move a club at those supersonic speeds that he's doing it at. Uh, uh, so, you know, I've had players come in, the guy you're talking about, exactly. I can show you how to swing faster, but your score is probably not going to get better. What do you want? You know, and 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 then uh, uh, I always like I have a very first things first approach to things, as you might have gathered. I'm kind of I try to anyway. I'd be very I watch the swing. I can see the leaks. I can see most of the time. I can just see watching the swing where the low hanging fruit is, and we're trying to address that. And it's not too hard to get most people to swing a few miles an hour faster. Question is, can they hit the low point? Can they square it up? Right? Is it? Is it? Are they going to be able to manage it? Uh, if they're trying to get too much force out of the body, too much vertical force, or too much rotational force to get more speed into the handle of the club, what is that going to do to the shape of their arc? What's that going to do to the you know to their contact? And if it's not really manageable, then you're not really accomplishing anything 
And the other part, as you both know, is that you can swing the club faster uh, and it releases faster, which um, looks good on track men, but the net result is the ball isn't carrying quite as far. You know, because the impact conditions aren't very good. Uh, like they're, they're releasing a bit early perhaps because you're applying the force too early. Um, so if you think you want to train effective speed for a really good player, you have to look at the whole system. You have to look at the whole parcel. And, and uh, uh, stability would be the first thing, right? So lower body core stability, that would be the first obvious things. If you see a lot of side to side movement, I can guarantee you that player is not achieving maximum efficiency, right? A lot of linear weight shifting going back and forth. If the body is stalling, obviously there's no way it can get into the hand path trick. So you might see an active lower body, uh, upper body is, isn't keeping up. Um, one of the things I do that's very, very simple is I, I'll ask a player to put a golf club across their hips, another one across their shoulders, and I'll ask them to try to them together. Most people go, oh, what? That, I mean, that can't be right. And so, and the biggest problem I see is that when the, when the pelvis is changing direction, uh, and it obviously has to to get the body to change direction and decelerate, that the upper body is keeping up. Gets way out ahead sometimes because they're not connecting the muscles, the slings, you know, from the pelvis to the shoulder area and the rib cage. It, it's just not, not there. Now, what does that do? Well, if you have a lot of side bend coming down, that's actually getting into the hand path and it's preventing the hand path from accelerating and so also having a big impact on the center mass of the club and what it's doing. It's going, as soon as it starts to stall, that club is going to release earlier. It starts speeding up and then it's going to slow down pretty fast. So um, anyway, that's my answer. Uh, it is be, be aware of what your goals are. And be sure that if you, yes, you want to, okay, you want to go from 90 to 96 miles an hour with that driver. If you just try to do it with your arms and hands, it isn't going to happen. You have to coordinate the whole motion. And are you strong enough to do that? So the truth is, and being very honest, is that with, with a player is I'll send you to see my physio first. My physio is, is a golf wizard. And he understands the body, he understands the golf swing. Go see him. I did when I was trying to get on the Champions Tour. The guy, and I'm not, this is no BS. The guy added 27 yards to my driver in 15 minutes by tweaking my back, my spine. I've been I was so locked up, I didn't even know it. When I got off his table, I felt like I was 15 years old. I just was launching balls over the where I was teaching at a driving range at the time, I was launching balls over the net. I couldn't ever, never hit a drive over the net at the back of the range. I was carrying them over the bloody thing. I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. So range of motion, strength, stability, balance, all those things. That would be a good starting point because if the guy has some restrictions, that's, that's not going to be good, right? You don't see too many long drive people with restrictions in their body movement. Uh, and you don't see too many long on the tour with a lot of restrictions. You know, Rob, you're supposed to be one of the best instructors in the world. You got to give me some a buzzword or something to make all these guys hit it further. I mean, you keep giving me just it's hard work and dedication and getting the body right and doing all the hard stuff. I'm, I'm yeah, Jack Nicholas, uh, Jack Nicholas said uh, a long time ago, so when I want to swing, when I want to hit the ball farther, I relax more. I talked to a guy who was playing in Europe, and uh, he was a bartender. He was a golf pro. He played in the British Open first round with Nicholas. <laughs> and after the first three or four holes, he's thinking to himself, this, this, not, this guy's not a big deal. This American guy is no big deal. And they got to this par five, and he blew it about 60 yards past this guy. And he was just operating in cruise control. He had, he probably had an eight-speed transmission and was playing in fifth, fifth year most of the time. I don't know. Hal would know. I'm sure you played with him. But uh, you think about that analogy. Like this is what I find so fascinating about what we do as coaches. You think back on a statement like a guy like that makes, and you think, I relax more. Well, what happens when you relax more? Your muscles don't tense up. Your range of motion increases. Your coil increases. The, the, the time that the club has to accelerate increases. And as long as you're smooth and coordinating that action, 
the net result is that club is going to be moving a lot faster through impact. And it didn't come from, it just, it, it came from lengthening your, the, 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 the length of your swing. Did you see Sasha McKenzie do that thing with uh, uh, the gentleman that does the uh, science, science, golf science thing? Anyway, oh, uh, Cordy. Yeah, Cordy. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. So Sasha says, okay, we'll swing, do your backswing much faster. And he went from 113, I think, to 119, like that, which he'd never done before. Now, all right, that's great, but are you going to be able to hit the fairway? Right. <laughs> well, and you brought up, too, like TPI's done a ton of research on just longer backswings can create more speed, more time. Um, so you're talking about the importance of flexibility and, and looseness of no mu muscle tension to create the, the opportunity for more speed. So absolutely. Yes, I do. But at the same time, I want to, uh, I'm, I'll, I'll go on record as saying that all of my pipes, when physically possible, have what looks like a three-quarter length backswing. Short and with wide. Rounds, with the rounds. Yeah. Right? And I want, I, I've just proven it a million times, that more compact, connected backswing yields more consistent distance control and directional control. Better low point control. And then driver at close to parallel? I don't know. That's in context. Like we're talking about a 13 year old girl. That driver is going to probably get past parallel, right? And and they don't. And you need that because they need that. Like you got. You know. Here's the other thing. You got 13 year old girl who's let's say five foot four, and you got in the same competition one that's five eight or five nine. You no, know, weighs her by 40 pounds. Right. You know. She's got. To, you, you can't. Obviously, you can't teach the look that looks right when she's hitting it 20 yards shorter. Right. Michelle, Michelle hit the ball 20, 30 yards past older kids, and she's tiny. And if you saw her swing, like I showed, like if you saw her swing, you'd say, what the hell are you teaching her? I, her iron swing didn't look anything like a driver's swing. <laughs> her iron swing looked pretty damn sweet, but but the, the, the length that she had, such a huge turn with her driver, huge coil. And get the club, she get the club around behind her, and then she would use her legs and her body, use lots of vertical force. And that club had, I'll tell you, I carried for her in three junior world tournaments, and I don't think she missed three fairways. Yeah, <laughs> it's possible to do. And then when now she's 14, and it's, it's her body is completely changed. Yeah. Uh, but all of those things that she did learn, I'm happy to say. Uh, uh, we this past COVID year has given us all an opportunity. It wasn't a negative. It's been a really great blessing because you can take a tournament player and now you have time to make some major adjustments and and, and go to the next level, which she's done. And uh, uh, the swing has gone from a lot less rotational looking to a lot more conventional stuff. She's taller. She's stronger. And what we're interested in, like she's over, she can swing over 100 miles an hour right now. And that's exciting to watch a girl. I, I've only had a couple of girls that have ever done that. Um, um, and you know, club head speed is, is seven iron speed right now is 79 to 81 range. That's plenty good enough. Uh, one of the problems I'm seeing though, uh, how we'll find this interesting is the irons today the loft on them is stupid. My Mizuno 7 iron, when I played, uh, was 36, yeah, 36 degrees. My 8 iron was 40. My 7 iron tailor made blade here is 31 degrees. So, yeah, the ball is going farther, but the trajectory is lower and the landing angle isn't as good. And if you're a kid and you're using strong off with clubs, it's hard for you to stop the ball in the green, especially if you have a little bit of power. So, yeah, anyway. It's a, 41, 40 degree pitching wedges. It's insane. Yeah. Al, yeah. Final, final thoughts? Well, I, so many so many people today are concerned with what someone else is hitting into the green. And there's so many variables that is dictating that. And certainly the number on the bottom of the club, uh, 
doesn't have much bearing anymore. We used to all carry a similar loft seven iron or pitching wedge or whatever. Now, not, not even close to the case. And, you know, one of the things that you talked about earlier was not, you thought one of the biggest problem is trying too hard. The last 30 minutes that you've been talking about speed, trying too hard works against speed, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Like it, there's, <laughs> oh, uh, I see, I see a person swinging a speed stick, for example, yeah. and they say, oh, it's 120 miles an hour. Okay, come downstairs, put a driver in your hand, or put a four iron in your hand, and I'm track man, and see what the difference is. I guarantee you that if you or me, or, any, or particularly, um, could swing, because you got, you're strong, you got big arc, you, you could use your hands and wrists, and you could add speed to that, the end of that stick, uh, and make it feel like it's an alignment stick. But you can't hit a golf ball, and and uh, that's not how a good sequence in golf works. Uh, throwing a medicine ball is great exercise, lots of fun. But that's not how hands and arms work in golf. They don't apply the same forces to throw. It's good for working on core. It's good for working on stability, and but it's not the same thing. And uh, uh, I will tell you, I don't need to tell you this. But Obviously, know it, but um, I've had conversations with the top four biomechanists in golf in, in the world and uh, and some of the top teachers. And if you're dragging the club through impact, that's fine, that's your option. You can control certain things with it. You are not going to create your optimal blend of speed and, and consistency. You need to release the golf club, you need to let the energy pass to the golf club to, to get the best of both worlds. Uh, and there's times when you're going to hit a knockdown punch driver, which is fine because there's the circumstance requires it. You want to know how to do that, but that's not going to be your bread and butter driver swing. <laughs> yeah. It's great. Well, Rob, this has been a lot of great information here today, and uh, we're honored that you took the time out of your busy schedule at the academy there. Uh, out of curiosity, before we leave, how many kids do you have in your academy right now? That's a good question. Uh, my average teacher does 25 hours of, of work a week, uh, sometimes a little more, uh, sometimes a little less. But on an average, it's about 25 hours a week. Uh, we have five teachers, and so you can do the math on that. Now, yep. within that, 25 hours, they're actually seeing 10 to 12 students. So active right now, I think we're probably around 65, 70 students. We have, you know, probably a couple hundred on our, on our, in our program, but uh, uh, COVID has changed a lot of stuff, you know, in our, in our programming. Uh, we do over a million dollars a year in business, uh, in lesson business. And even right now, we're doing that. Um, and it's an interesting formula. Like when you teach like we, this program does and you're working with elite players, you don't need, uh, it, it depends on the economics of your area. I'm gonna, we're, Vancouver's a pretty affluent area. So if I was working out in West Texas or East Texas or something like that, and there's a lot of money around, you gotta do what you gotta do. But here you have, uh, 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 you have a good income uh, fa family, families have good income often they're quite well off uh, they don't care they they don't care what it costs, they just want it the best, so you try and cater to that and, and uh, what happens Like if you think about the philosophy it's if, if you have 10 players and you're a teacher and you're seeing one of them two hours a week and you're seeing a couple of them three hours a week that adds up pretty fast and you have quality control. You can be on things. Like I have, I have one time I'll have eight to 15 kids in a tournament at the same tournament. And at night, I'm text, text messaging with them or I'm even talking to them on the phone about their round. How did it go? What do you need help with? What didn't you do well? What did you do well? Okay, keep more weight on your left side tomorrow. You won't hit your wedges thin or fat. You know, something like that. 
there's a lot of work that goes in behind that 20, 25 hours a week that people don't see. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's, it's yeah, I, I, you know, you don't get there overnight. You don't start there. Uh, uh, if you have a nice facility and you have good quality staff, you can start to try and develop that like you guys are doing. Uh, you got to build a reputation. You got to build, uh, you got to be able to show evidence of results. And yeah, like, and I, it's also nicer as a teacher to, you know, I've done the 100, 100 lessons a week thing. And <laughs> uh, now I'm, I'm able to charge a lot more and I'm able to work less time. And so I have better quality of life. And uh, there's a mentality out there that I didn't, I had the same mentality. I mean, hell, when I started off, adults were paying, I don't know, I can't even remember now, it was probably say 50 bucks for a half hour lesson and or less with a five lesson package, you know? And then juniors would be two thirds of that. They'd get a discount. Now I charge more for juniors than I do for adults. That's fact. I charge, I'm in the $230 an hour range for a junior and I'm in the $150 range for your average adult that wants to come in the daytime, just wants some help with something. That guy isn't going to pay 230, 250 bucks in a program. He doesn't want a program. It's often I give that to our newer teachers, but but uh, uh, I think you know you got to decide. Uh, I, I remember listening to a teacher tell me how he, he went out and bought business cards and had a beautiful sign, and he put up a tent. And he was on this driving range, and it didn't take him very long to realize that he wasn't going to make a living like that because there was nobody there. So if you're a young teacher, go and you're trying to make it in this business, first thing is, uh, what type of golf do I want to teach? Who do I want to teach it to? And how do I put myself in a position where I, I'm in front of those people? It's kind of like, you know, you can try and push the train. You can stand in front of the train and let it run you over. Yeah, I'd rather be staying in front of it and let it run you over than trying to, trying to, to push it all the time. In other words, uh, uh, go to a busy driving range. If I was to move to Texas, from here with my experience today, um, the first thing I would look for is who can, where do the people live that can afford my abilities? And where are those people that want my abilities? And then the next step is what facilities are in that area that uh, I can do a good quality job working with? And that's kind of how my mind works now. Uh, 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 if I were to, and this would surprise a lot of people, but let's say those opportunities may not be available. Uh, okay, where's a really high volume driving range? I would go into the driving range owner and I'd say, tell you what, I'm prepared to give you $15,000 in gift certificates that you can give to your best clients. And I'm gonna teach for the first two months here free. I'll do up to 40 hours a week. You can give these clients. Now imagine you've been going to a driving range for two years and you've been paying 10 bucks a bucket or you've been buying your range pass. And one day you walk in and say, you know what? I appreciate, I appreciate your business. We happen to have this really good instructor here who's volunteered to help my clients. Here's his gift certificate. You can make an appointment with him. It's free. Now, there's some complications with that, I realize. But uh, uh, for the most part, that's the work ethic. I'm fully prepared to stand in front for two months in an area where nobody knows me and meet people, greet people, improve people, and I am confident that 15% of those people in that two months will become clients. That's, now we're off again. Now we're on the start. And by the way, do you have a grandkid? Do you have a kid that likes golf? da 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 da, -da whatever. And then you can start building it. The difference is, I'm not going to sit in a chair reading a newspaper with a cigarette hanging out of my mouth, waiting for somebody to come and ask me for a golf lesson. So anyway, that's my 10 cents. <laughs> no, that, that's, that's very smart and pretty strong right there. Um, well, Rob, as always, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming on here. You've given us a ton of information and a, and a ton of, uh, ton of stuff for our, our listeners to, to digest. Yeah. Um, and again, <laughs> You've, you've, you know, had, had and built one of the most successful golf academies in the world. And so you're obviously doing something right. And uh, we're just honored that you would come on here and, and share, share your knowledge with us. 
Well, I would. I, if it, I'm telling you right now, if COVID hadn't happened, I would have been down to see you guys. I was really looking forward to seeing your new, your new facility and this amazing uh, uh, area that you're in. It's, it's it's like a resort or a reserve, I think, isn't it? It's like no. So we, we yeah, it, we were at Big Easy Ranch for a while, but yeah, Hal and I we opened up our own place in uh, in Houston. So okay. now we've yeah we've got about a five thousand square foot facility with about eight eight bays now. So we. We we're not quite as big as yours, but we uh, we designed it a little bit uh, very similarly for sure. Well, yeah. If I had if I'd known I was going to have this kind of success here, I would have done two more bays in it. But uh, uh, and I may I may still do that. Um, but yeah, no. I I, I uh, you guys have a wonderful opportunity. If you've got a lot of experience, I mean, how there's few people in the world with Hal's experience in the game. And uh, the strength, like if you're trying to market to good players, I think that's a, a really key point that you get to sit down with a guy that's done the things that Hal's done in his career uh, and met, get mentored uh, on playing the game, right? On, on how to work, how to practice, uh, how, to, how to have a, you know, a mentally tough attitude. You have a technical background right, that's really strong right, through, through your many different people that you're learning from. Uh, so it's a great team. It's a great combination. You have great passion, uh, but you've got to get people in front of you. You got to do shit for free. You got to invite, you got to do seminar. You got to invite people in and, and meet them and let them see your passion. Let them see your place. Let them see you've got this huge investment and it's impressive. Right. And like, I guarantee you, those kids are going to walk out there. They're going to get in the car with your mom and your dad. They're going to say, I want to go there. I want to be there. You know, and, and, and that's, yeah, nothing, nothing happens until somebody sells something. You, you can get away with when you have been doing it as long as I have. We don't advertise. We don't do a lot of promotional stuff anymore. I ask, like, I ask someone, I get calls every day. What, can I, can we, can I, I go to Colin, I go to Matt, or I go to the other day. You can, can you take two more students? No, thanks. I can't. Okay, that's good. So I have a couple of new junior teachers. There you go. And I work with them and that new student, and I try and share their experience. And then, because what it, that's the other problem is like usually they'll come to an academy because the teacher has a big name, uh, and you want to get them to work with other teachers. How do you do that? How do you, that was, for me, that was a very difficult thing to overcome for a long time because they want you. They don't want somebody else that has less experience. So you create a program that kind of makes sense to them. And one of the things I've learned is uh, don't want two golf teachers in your academy teaching the same students golf swings or chipping or putting. It's okay if one teaches putting, leaves the rest to somebody else, but they don't want the, the same message coming from two different people. So if I'm doing swing, I'll do swing, you do short game with that person. And that works. Uh, uh, we've tried it the other way. Uh, it doesn't work. It just, they get really confused. And it, it, as much as, like I, three of the five teachers I have right now could look at a golf swing and I could look at them, they'll look at me and they'll smile. And they'll pretty much say exactly the same observation. But the way they put that information across to the student is totally different. The way they might approach the problem is unique. And you have to respect that because they're in, human beings are intelligent enough to know that this, this way I'm trying to improve this situation isn't working very well. So they'll try another, another approach. Or maybe they'll come and they'll ask me what I think. Sometimes they do that. Uh, but but you cannot create a system in your academy where every, it's like a cookie cutter and everybody teaches the same stuff because you will fail. I guarantee you will fail in the high performance world you fail. You have to do this, appeal to these people individually. This doesn't mean that you can't have small group programs. It doesn't mean you can't service different needs, but for your high performance player, it's gotta be, the message has to be delivered just my opinion to them. And uh, 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 anyway, I'm, I'm happy to uh, talk to anybody that's listening to this thing uh, uh, and share experience on the business side, uh, uh, on the market. It's, 
I mean, we're, we're blessed. This is a lot of fun, this job. You get a lot of personal satisfaction and we get paid really well. That's not so bad. But don't have the attitude out there that you're undervaluing yourself. Don't undervalue yourself. You got a Jeez, Houston, man, there's tons of money in Houston. There's tons of people that are willing to pay. Look, the way I, I explain this to people is this. Like you're an adult, you're a parent, and you come in. And they say, well, geez, Rob, that's pretty expensive. And I say, well, respectfully, yes, it is. But let me tell you what really expensive is. You've been taking golf lessons somewhere else for two years, and your kid's handicap doesn't change much. How much money have you spent? And I say, well, you know, in some cases, it's six thousand, eight thousand dollars, maybe ten thousand dollars a year that they've spent. And the kid, you basically, you almost have to start from the beginning with this person. That's a waste of money. That's a waste of time. That isn't going to happen on our watch. And I will stand behind that with a full guarantee. Right? If someone said to me, the last month of lessons, it's never happened. But if they did, either here's your money back or the next month is free until we're on, we're on the same page. Here. Pride in your workmanship, right? Pride in that gives people confidence in you, right? That you're not all about the money. I don't feel bad. I don't feel bad being a high priced teacher. And I'll tell you why. When, you know, I had a, a girl two weeks ago. She, she got, we, we got, she, she got herself, I've been working with her eight years. She's on the junior development team for Golf Canada. She didn't have anything going on for college prospects. And I said, if you take that offer and you get on Team Canada, automatically college prospects are going to be observing you. The father had to pay out about $6,800. They're putting in more money than that that Team Canada is, but that's his share. It's a fair amount of money for some people. And she's, she's going to Kent State. That happened like that. Now, when you get somebody who goes to Yale, and you, you pick them up and they're shooting 82 in tournaments. A year and a half later, they're shooting even par and they get an offer from Yale or, or, or something, you don't feel so bad. You didn't charge enough. <laughs> and, and, and so uh, anyway, that's my, my 10 cents. You, you don't under, there's people out there that overvalue what they do. Uh, my advice is that if you, and it's it's mind boggling to me. Like this is your child. Do your due diligence. Ask questions. Ask what makes you guys different. You know, because everybody looks really cool today on a website, and everybody out there lies about their results. They 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 make these you know. They say, oh yeah, our professionals have won sixty tournaments. They're talking about local tournaments, right? They're talking about. They never even tried to get a tour card. They're not, but they, the re website makes them look like they're amazing. And and I hate that because kids go there for a couple of years and they don't get better. It's just, it's, so you've got to do your homework. And uh, 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 there's not a lot of guidelines in our industry <laughs> for, for stuff like this. Uh, beware. I'll take us, take us home. Well, Rob, thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. Lots of great information. And uh, I'm sure our listeners got a lot out of what you talked about today. Uh, I know I did. Uh, you reminded me of a few things that I used to think about. Uh, I'm not so sure at 63 years old what good it's going to do me at this point. But uh, I'm going to put some of it into use here in 15 minutes. I'm going to work on my swing. Okay, uh, send me a video. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks again, Rob. We appreciate it. <laughs> My honor. Thank you, Hal. I, I love what you guys are doing, and uh, here to help you. If I Rob, can. thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, Rob. Bye. Well, speaking of magic pixie dust, I tried to get get Rob to give us some some pixie dust to help our listeners at home hit it a lot farther and unfortunately he said they got to get stronger, and that's that's no fun. No one wants to go get in the gym and go do that like that. Well, that no. That's what Hal Sutton needs to do. <laughs> well, that's, what I, that's what Chase Cooper needs to do, too. Well, you know, that's true. I mean, and, you know, he made the statement, uh, something, I don't remember exactly what it was, but something to the tune of uh, your strength will help you manage as much speed as you can have, whatever that is. And, uh, you know, 
we've all felt out of control, swinging really hard out of control. And, you know, I was the opposite when I played. I, I swung what you've heard within myself my whole life. And I can't remember where I really swung at it hard in a tournament, you know, coming down the stretch where I needed something. Yeah. I, I depended on solid and straight. And, you know, I just didn't do the things that we're teaching today. Right. Uh, well, and, and I, I found myself, and, and I, we've been fortunate to have some awesome guests on here already, and I found myself, like, not, especially with the instructors, I'm like, that's that's what we're trying to do here. That's what we're trying to do here. You know, and, and he mentioned, you know, again, the speed you can manage. Like, get these kids to swing, at, especially with irons. Like, get these kids to swing at it proficiently. And then get them stronger, get, right. them, get them to go. And, you know, we've always kind of taken that approach. It's never been a, oh, you've got to swing out of your shoes and then, you know, learn how to hit it super far and then we'll, we'll, we'll bring you back. It's kind of been a two-pronged approach where, like, let's get the golf swings decent and let's also speed train them a little bit at the same time. And, yeah, do we, do we want our kids swinging 120% on the, on the golf course? No. You know, but at the, at the same time, like a downwind par five that's wide open, they can, they can rear back and let it rip every once in a while and no real consequences. Well, I'm trying to think right now if I can remember playing with people that swung at it as hard as they could swing at it all the time. Yeah. And from my era, I don't remember that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I... There are a lot of guys that swing at it really hard now, sure. but they're a lot stronger than we were. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I've said this several times. We were told not to work out, yeah. and they're told the opposite. So they're a different sort of human being now. And there's there's some chatter from from Twitter about how you know guys on tour now can swing at it all out because of how big the driver is. And I think I think it's more so the the weight of the driver, but also. You know, you guys hit it in the screws. The guys on tour hit it in the screws. They hit it solid 90, 99 times out of nine times out of ten, whatever the number is. I think still though, the misses with the old stuff made you have to kind of kind of tune it, tone it down a little bit. Like a a toe hit with the, today's equipment just does not go as far offline as a as a toe hook uh, did back in the day. I mean, that ball curved miles, yeah. and it can still curve. And it, you know, I. You know, I think that the fairway hit percentage is about the same as it was in your day versus now, but it's more so like these guys are, are going at it closer to 100, 100 to max out versus you guys. Well, you just go look at an old driver, if any of you have an old wooden driver, and you set it next to your new you know, 450cc driver or right. whatever it is, and you tell me if you think you can swing at 100-something miles an hour and hit the center of that club as efficiently as you can that 450cc. Right. Uh, one of the things he talked about, uh, again, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but just he, he kind of teaches all of his players to have, you know, three quarter back swings with the irons. I thought that was that was strong because we, you know, for those of you guys that have been longtime listeners, we've talked a ton about low point control when it comes to hitting a golf ball. You know, every golf swing is a circle and the bottom of the circle is the lowest point of that circle and and the holy grail of iron play is controlling that low point every time really the holy grail of, go of a golf swing is controlling the low point even with the driver but with the irons it's so important because the ball's sitting on the ground right and you know him talk telling his players or getting his players to 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 never really take it to parallel to feel nice and nice and you know a little wider and a little bit more compact and shorter and and tighter and all that stuff you know, he's basically getting them to learn how to control their low point, and he they don't need to hit six iron, two hundred twenty-five yards. They're, his guys don't. They can hit at one ninety, one eighty-five, and be just fine. The better you control your low point, the more you can control your trajectory. The more you control your trajectory, the more you're going to be able to play in all the conditions. And you know, he he's fine tuning all of his guys and girls to what you're just talking about. Yep. And you know. You know, people that wake up that hit it like this when the wind is blowing, they can't wait to get out there because the rest of you that are hitting it like this want to go back to bed when you see the wind blowing. That's right. And, you know, Chase and I talk about this all the time, controlling trajectory, controlling trajectory. And, you know, if you can control your trajectory and you do that with low point control and shaft length, which come from a shorter backswing uh, or controlled backswing, uh, you're going to have the advantage when there's elements. Right. You have a chance. You're not one-dimensional. Right. 
And and I think that's that right there is what our goal has been with all of our players to not make you so one dimensional where you only have you can only play well in certain conditions. And he's obviously done that, producing as many you know D one players and, and tour players as he has. Right. He's been doing it a long time. Yeah, Rob. Um, like like we said in the beginning, Rob, super 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 smart. We were pumped to have him on. He's had a ton of success up in Canada, and uh, you know, again, it's just another example of of some awesome guests we're trying to bring on and share their story and really learn from them. I mean, yeah. everybody has something that we can learn from, and and Rob's a great example of that. And you know, in the five or six years I've known him, six or seven years I've known him, I've always felt like he was a mentor. And and honestly, he was one of the people we contacted when we were thinking about doing this, just to get some ideas and see if there was you know anything from an academy standpoint that he would have done differently and he was always always so quick to share his share what knowledge what awesome knowledge he had and we, we you know we can only thank him for that it was a great guest and probably somebody that not everybody's heard of but certainly has earned your respect i think that's exactly right so again thanks for tuning in um you know, check us out on the the website househuntgolf.com check us out on on all of our social media pages we will, uh, again, strive to bring you guys the best guests we can. As always, if you have any questions, if you have any topics you want us to cover, don't hesitate to reach out, like, and share the podcast for us. Uh, thanks again for tuning in, guys, and how we'll see you next week. See you next week. I was distracted. I was looking up and saw that. Be the right club today. Yes!